Jews. And gradually the Jews, or at least many of them, lost the facility of reading and hearing Hebrew. So a translation of the Old Testament, as we now call it, was written, a translation into Greek, about 200 BC. That translation or version is called the Septuagint. And it's this version, I have a copy with me here tonight, this version of God's Word, which was used in the synagogues of the Jews. Most Jews and proselytes who possessed copies of the Bible had the Greek translation. It was used for memorization and teaching. This version, the Greek Septuagint, was the Bible of the church for most people of that day. So in this translation into Greek, what way did things go with the Psalms? Well, the book of praises in Hebrews is now called the Psalms, or the Psalter. The Psalm titles themselves contain three words, and only three words, to refer to these Psalms as material to be sung. Psalms, the Greek psalmos, hymns, the Greek hymnos, and songs, ode. Now what happened when the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Judah, Samaria, and beyond? The apostles, as we read in the book of Acts especially, went first to the synagogue. And there God called his elect people from their midst, who were Jews and proselytes, who became the nucleus of the New Testament church. Others joined them too, and their Bible was the Septuagint. And nobody, as far as I'm aware, debates this. Now let's come to the key texts in this debate, Ephesians 5 verse 19 and Colossians 3 verse 16. At least I would guess at this stage they will be key texts. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. The question is, what is meant by psalms, hymns, and songs? More basic, how are we going to determine what is meant by psalms, hymns, and songs? Do we, on the one hand, come with our own preconceived view of what these words currently mean in the 21st century, or do we let the historical and scriptural context determine what Paul meant, what the Ephesians and the Colossians would understand these terms to mean? Let's look first at the word psalm. Just about everybody, including hymn singers, admit that the biblical psalms are meant. Reverend John Douglas and Reverend John Greer, two free Presbyterian ministers, said this too in their recent speeches on this subject. Psalms, obviously, is the title of the canonical book in the Septuagint. It's also found in 67 of the psalm titles, 11 times in the psalms themselves. That's very simple. The book of hymns. Or sorry, the word hymns, what does that mean? Well, we looked at the Hallel Psalms, which Christ sang after the Lord's Supper. And we saw that they were called hymns. Matthew 26 and Mark 14. In Hebrews chapter 12, Jesus Christ says, I will declare thy, that is God's name, unto my brethren in the midst of the church, church of the Old Testament, will I sing praise unto thee, or will I hymn unto thee. And this hymn is a quotation from Psalm 22 and verse 22. What well, also about the Septuagint translation of the Psalms? The word hymn is found in six titles, seven times in the Psalms themselves. In the Septuagint, moreover, of 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Chronicles, and Nehemiah, there are some 16 examples in which the Psalms are called hymns or songs, and the singing of them is called hymning. A Jew called Philo, this is a secondary example, but it does show the way the word was used at that time. A Jew named Philo in Egypt, who died AD 40, round about this time, frequently refers to and designates certain psalms as hymns. That's his dominant word. You and I would call them psalms. He, in his world in that day, he mostly called them hymns. The same thing with Josephus. He repeatedly calls the Psalms hymns, a Jew in the last two-thirds of the first century AD. 
Then we move on to songs. The word song is found in 36 of the psalm titles of the Septuagint and nine times in the psalms themselves. With the word songs, we have the adjective spiritual. Spiritual means, in the Bible, of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual in the Bible means a lot more than religious. Here are songs of the Holy Spirit. And the psalms are most definitely songs of the Holy Spirit. They are inspired, indicted, breathed forth by the Holy Spirit as His Word. Hebrews 3 verse 7, As the Holy Ghost, or as the Holy Spirit, saith, Today if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. A quotation from Psalm 95. B.B. <coughs> Warfield, in this classic quote, explains the word spiritual in the Bible. Of the 25 instances in which the word spiritual or of the Holy Spirit occurs in the New Testament, in no single case does it sink even as low in its reference as the human spirit. And the 24 of them is derived from Terma, the Holy Spirit, in the sense of belonging to or determined by the Holy Spirit. The New Testament usage is uniform, with the one single exception of Ephesians 6 verse 12, where it seems to refer to the higher though superhuman intelligence evil angels. The appropriate translation for it in each case is spirit given, spirit led, or spirit determined. Now this adjective spiritual, or of the Holy Spirit, certainly qualifies the word psalms. It may well qualify psalms hymns, as well as psalms. That would fit with the Greek grammar. I'm not going to insist upon that. It's enough for me tonight that it qualifies psalms. <laughs> At this point, someone might say, so the verse then means sing to yourselves in psalms, psalms, and psalms. To that we respond, of course, that the Bible is filled with many triplets, if I may so speak. Miracles, wonders, and signs. Acts 2, verse 22. Jesus Christ was approved by miracles, wonders, and signs. God forgives, according to Exodus 34, verse 7, iniquity and transgression and sin. These three words, psalms, hymns, and songs, are used as these are the three terms, and the only three terms, used in the church's Bible for the psalms as inspired compositions to be sung. Now there are various contributions too in the Septuagint Psalter titles. Twelve times are we told that one of the odes is a psalm and song. Two of the phrases used here. Twice it's called a psalm and a hymn. In Psalm 75, called Psalm 76 in the Septuagint, it's called a psalm and a hymn and a song. Three words used in Ephesians and Colossians. And this combination of singing and making melody in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in Ephesians 5 is found in other places and different forms in Septuagint Psalter. Now, with these inspired odes, the Christian is well equipped to fulfill the calling of the text to teach and admonish one another. That's what we do in singing, according to the Bible. That's part of it, at least. Teaching and admonishing. One of the words used in the psalm titles is masquil, which most reckon to mean something like this, teach or instruct. And the content of themselves, the 150 psalms, gives us a lot of teaching. Admonishing. The psalms, the more you sing them, you'll realize the more you are admonished by God's holy word. Trust in the Lord and do good. Psalm 37 verse 3. Delight thyself in the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Various verses in the 37th psalm. Here we are teaching and admonishing with infallible psalms. Do you wish to teach and admonish in your church with fallible hymns, which are of themselves, can err, and have err? Colossians 3 also talks about the word of Christ. The psalms are unmistakably